Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And uh, we're going to begin uh, our study here with a word of prayer in a minute. Um, but just want to make a couple of comments. So um, <clears throat> this, these studies just um, uh, we're going to have, of course, I'm going to do a sermon tomorrow. Uh, Dwight's going to do his study. And um, uh so I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing as a sermon. I might actually continue this study. We'll see what happens. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, pray before we begin. <clears throat> Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for uh, your hand in our lives and for uh, the people that you have placed in our lives. Uh, we're thankful for the blessings of friendship and family. And we're thankful, Lord, for the trials that we face. Uh, we know, Lord, that um, everything that comes to us, you have foreseen, and it is for our good. So we pray for one another. We ask, Lord, that um, uh, you can uh, bless each person who's been studying this message and bless their families and their friends and their the people that they influence. So we invite your spirit's presence here um, in this study this evening. And we know that this topic is we've been gleaning uh, after the harvest, so to speak, and finding precious wheat that has been overlooked. And we know, Lord, that these precious truths uh, can feed us um, we know, Lord, that we are poor and needy, and it's the poor and needy that, that do the gleaning, and so we are thankful, Lord, for the things that you give us, that you have provided for us. So we invite your spirit into our hearts, into this study, that you can give us insight, that you can correct thinking that we've had that has hindered our walk with you, and that the light can uh, pierce into the darkness, to the dark recesses of our hearts, and show us our need of you. Please be with us now. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath again. So, the fundamental problem. Now, this is the fundamental problem of 1888. It's an evaluation of the message of 1888. And of course, I, I began to experience this very early on. Um, so it would have been 1985. Um, let me see, 1980. Yeah, so it would have been 1985. Um, we had started the Upper Room Bible Studies. And even before we started the Upper Room Bible Studies, that was April 20th, 1985, that we started. That's the first Sabbath. My, my third son, Micah, was born just the evening before. Uh, that's how I remember when the study started. He was born April 19th. And um, so we uh, – and I had been reading uh, Froome's book, which we looked at, um, which I got from the church library. Um, uh, the book was called, what was it called again? Um, Movement of Destiny. And I'd already started buying some of Jones and Wagner's books. I did happen to have Wagner's book, uh, Christ Our Righteousness. And so I read what Froome said about it. I hadn't read the book yet of, of Wagner's. And 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 I got a completely different impression about what Wagner was teaching compared to what Froome said Wagner was teaching. Um, I also remember at that time early on, so, I, so you know, this is 85. I was baptized December of, of 82, December 25th, 82. So, um, <clears throat> so at that time I was, um, you know, trying to understand Adventism. I mean, I hadn't studied to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Um, and, and that spring uh, was the first time I had gone to an evangelistic series. So in 1985, I went to evangelistic series. One of the guys that got baptized in that series ended up being uh, my best friend for a while. And 
he was the one who suggested we have this Bible study group in the attic of my house. And, and Kelly's just shown up here. And, of course, uh, Kelly lived in my attic at the time where we had the Bible uh, study. Ah, the upper room. Yeah, the upper room. So I'm just going back and talking about uh, uh, when I first started studying righteousness by faith. Um, and uh, so I had studied it from the Protestant perspective. So before... Um, I had read Jones and Wagner. I'd read books by Andrew Murray, and there were some other writers. Uh, sort of, uh, Andrew Murray was a Presbyterian minister who wrote about righteousness by faith, and there were some other writers that I had read as well. And and I wasn't really satisfied with what I was reading. Now I remember, uh, you know, so one is I was reading Froome's book, Movement of Destiny. Um, the other thing that really struck me was reading Desire of Ages. So I'd started reading Desire of Ages, which is a good book to read, especially if you're a new Adventist. Um, so that was when I was living at the 65th Street house, uh, which has recently been torn down, by the way, Kelly. The house isn't there anymore. Oh, that's, that's uh, unfortunate. I'm, it, it almost would have qualified for a new place. Yeah, and so they're building, uh, they tore down not just our house, but the Vanderland's house, just south of us. And, yeah, but the address, the address of the new building is still going to be 12936 Street. Okay, probably an so, apartment block or something. Yeah, sort that of a little apartment. High, high density residential there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. So, not like the neighborhood when I grew up in it. It's all just single family dwellings now. It's all uh, yeah, apartments. The lot that the lot that, that house the I call it the greenhouse sometimes. Your father got all that green paint yeah, on it. Was, so. was green. Yeah, it was they didn't get it on sale. We just you got green because that's the color we wanted. Okay. Uh, <laughs> now, now I know, but that lot was uh, two lots, wasn't it? I mean, it was, and it was probably, a lot and a half. Probably quite. Yeah. A what? So it was a lot and a half, yeah. A lot and a half, yeah. Nice big anyway. garden. And, yeah. <laughs> it was a great place to grow up as a kid. Not so great after I lived there when uh, Micah was born, because the neighborhood had really started to change, of course, with the new apartments and all that. But anyway, so, because, um, you know, Micah was born the day before the first upper room Bible study. So I was just talking a bit about that before you came on. But anyway, so nice to see you, Kelly. Um, so, so we had this uh, Bible study, but but so so I started reading Desire of Ages. Now, my dad had been a United Church of Canada minister, um, and they my my brothers and my dad was like uh, well they called him a lay minister because he wasn't ordained yet. He didn't have enough schooling to be ordained. Um, but uh, so my brother John and David and Stephen, they're all born in different places because my dad would be a minister at some place for a little while. And while he was in Saskatchewan, which is right next to Alberta, um, he had bought some Uncle Arthur's bedtime storybooks. So that would have been probably when John and David were little, my older, oldest, two oldest brothers. And um, so we had these books. And even by the time I was little, they were starting to get a little bit tattered. Um, but my mom used to read these to me when I was a kid. And I never knew that they were Seventh-day Adventist books. But I remember my mom never wanted to read the, the stories about Jesus. For some reason, she didn't want to influence me or whatever. I don't know what it was. She just would read uh, the stories, you know, about the kids. But I would see these pictures of Jesus, and I would want, like, these stories read to me because there's an occasional Bible story in there. And... Um, and I was always really impressed by the Jesus in those books. There was something about that Jesus that was different than the Jesus that that I was exposed to in uh, the United Church material. And uh, um, so anyway, when I read Desire of Ages, I recognized the same Jesus that was in those Uncle Arthur's bedtime storybooks, that there was something different about the Adventist Jesus than the Jesus that I had been raised with. Now, I know that seems kind of odd in some ways, because we just think, well, all Christians just, you know, worship Jesus. But but I, it really struck me that that 
the Jesus that most people were worshiping that I would find in the popular religious books was actually not the Jesus of the Bible. It was definitely not the Jesus of Adventism. And, and now I knew this Jesus, so this Jesus I knew, and I could say, well, I just got it from the bedtime story books. But, but that was the Jesus I talked to, and that was the Jesus I saw in the Bible. And, and I always had this problem with other Christians because they didn't seem to know the Jesus that I knew. Um, and, and that always kind of puzzled me. You know, and I would read some of the books, even that my brother David would read, like Watchman Nee and so forth. And, and, and I found those books really unsatisfying. And, and of course, uh, Andrew Murray, I found these books unsatisfying. When I read Desire of Ages, it was just this huge revelation of Christ. Now, maybe people who've been raised Adventists don't have that same impression. And, and I think for Adventists, to some degree, um, the spirit of prophecy has been ruined um, by individuals who profess to believe in the spirit of prophecy and how they they look at Ellen White and how they present Ellen White. And But for me, looking at this really fresh, it was just such a powerful book. And what we're going to see here is that, you know, he's going to talk in this book here, um, 1888 Reexamined, about the fundamental problem of how to evaluate the 1888 message. And, and I think the fundamental problem is that, one is we need to have the, an experience, right? So it's, it's not just a message, an intellectual, intellectual message. But it's also a message that is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you assume that you know Christ, if you're approaching this from, that is, you're reading into Scripture, if you're reading into Jones and Wagner, your presuppositions, the things that you, your basic assumptions that you have about who Christ is and what the Bible means, um, that you're going to miss it. Now, I know when we read A.T. Jones' 1895 General Conference Bulletin, which is the one that I like the best out of all his General Conference Bulletins, but really just presenting this Christ as this something that, um, like who God is, is so different from what we understand about God to be. That's what I got from the 1895 General Conference Bulletins. And it, it's something that in my presentations, my sermons I did on love, uh, that I was trying to emphasize, that there is this love, and I guess I, you know, I probably have to finish part two, I think, tomorrow. So that's, I was trying to remember what I'm supposed to do. Anyway, um, but, you know, the, the first sermon that I did on love was really about how that God is so different from us that when we talk about love, we don't really know what we're talking about. It's not something that could just be explained. Like you can't explain to uh, somebody who's never experienced love what love is. It's like trying to explain the color blue to a blind man. You know, it's something that has to be experienced. And it's something that has to be acted out. So one is love begets love. You have to experience love from someone. But in order for it to really be meaningful, you have to give love, right? If, if you, and if you don't know how to give love, you, you're not going to know what love is. And, and with the gospel, with understanding Christ, this experience we have with Christ, um, you know, to me, it comes primarily from suffering. It comes from yoking up with Christ, taking up our cross daily and following him, that we begin to learn of him. And we learn of his meekness and his lowliness. And only then can we have rest, can we have peace. And so when we talk about this fundamental problem, as we're going to read through this, um, I don't necessarily agree with the writers here in, in, in certain points. Um, and, and we'll see where, where that is. But, but I think that whatever the message of 1888 is, that it is very little understood within the Adventist church. And that's not just because the liberals are following, you know, the new theology. 
um, because conservatives have exactly the same problem. That is, they're, they're all starting with the same premise, the same view of God. And, and some people have tried to modify this. Like you have the character of God people who think that, you know, God just doesn't kill. So somehow that, that, that does it. But all of those things are man's attempts to, to place God as to something that they want instead of accepting God as he is. So anyway, we're going to start reading through this and we'll talk about some of these ideas. The error of assuming that we accepted the message of 1888 stems from the still deeper un- error of misunderstanding that is what the message really was. The officially endorsed view that it was accepted also must assume that there was nothing uniquely Adventist about it. The message is evaluated as the doctrine of righteousness by faith, that is, the same doctrine that Protestants have believed for hundreds of years. The following from one of our esteemed authors, a general conference vice president, is typical of this widely accepted view of the message. So this is L.H. Christian, The Fruitage of Spiritual Gifts, page 239. Some may ask, what was this teaching of righteousness by faith, which became the mainspring of the great 1888 Adventist revival, as taught and emphasized by Mrs. White and others? It was the same doctrine that Luther, Wesley, and many other servants of God have been teaching. Have been teaching. Now, of course, you can see there, uh, they also have in there that there was this 1888 Adventist revival, which of course that revival never really came, um, not in the way that it was supposed to. Um, so uh, there's another point here. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to some of these things. Uh, we'll keep reading a bit. It would be grossly humiliating to confess that we rejected the same doctrine that Luther, Wesley, and many other servants of God had been teaching. Hence, we must say that we accepted the doctrine in and after 1888. Now, of course, the other thing um, is, well, we'll read this statement and then I'll talk about it. While another authoritative writer concedes that the 1888 message was the third angel's message in verity, as Ellen White characterized it in Review and Herald, April 1, 1890, he confuses the issue by insisting that many not Adventist evangelical leaders also proclaim the same general emphasis having obtained their message from the same source, the scriptures. Without exception, all these highly endorsed books of recent years logically imply that the verity of the third angel's message is nothing more than popular Protestant teaching. But one takes a consistent position to evaluate the 1888 message, as Ellen White did, nor recognizes any unique Adventist element in it. Uh, Froome's insistence is very clear. So before I read Froome's quote, I just want to go back to here. So we've talked about this before. The third angel's message in Verity. This is the thing where a Whelan in short take the idea that the third angel's message is the message of righteousness by faith. But that's not what Ellen White is saying. It is righteousness by faith. But so are the first and second angel's messages. So they're, the, they're righteousness by faith, but they're not righteousness by faith in verity. Now, this word verity, um, you know, why is she using that word? You know, because she's not saying righteousness by faith is the third angel's message. When we, when we look at the definition, so I'm just going to uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary. Um, so she's going to have to say that this is righteousness by faith is this third angel's message. So she could have just said that, right? She could have just said, oh, the message of the third angel is righteousness by faith or righteousness by faith is the third angel's message. So the word verity means truth, you know, in its simplest definition. Consonance of a statement, pro- proposition, or other thing to fact. So that it, that it, the righteousness by faith, the third angel's message, is consonant, right? That is, it's harmonious in, to fact in what righteousness is, right? 
It is a proposition of eternal verity or truth that none can govern while he is despised. Okay, so a true assertion or tenet, a moral truth, agreement of the words with the thoughts. Um, so we would say that what it is, is righteousness by faith is something in the experience of an individual that demonstrates the working of this three-step testing prophetic message, right? So when if we look at, you know, sin, righteousness, and judgment as these three steps, the work of the Holy Spirit, obviously the work of seeing yourself as a sinner is is a step in righteousness by faith, and so is uh, righteousness, right? That's that's you know you could talk about justification, sanctification, but then you have this this other one, judgment, which which I equate with glorification as well. This is where Christ's character, His glory, is seen upon His people. That's what the third angel's message is. So it's not just righteousness by faith; it's righteousness by faith in truth. It's it's a consonance of a consonance of a statement, right? Of a proposition or something. So it's the real thing. It's worked out in actuality. And so this is not well understood. And I've emphasized this point many times. But it's just this confusing idea. What's that? I say I'll interject there about yeah. it's not just a. A theology or whatever or an idea but yeah. a demonstration of god's character um and it's it's i like that verse that when jesus said if i be lifted up i will draw all unto me and people often will read that and think oh that the whole world's going to but it's for the whole of creation will be drawn unto christ or demonstration of christ's character that's to be perfectly reproduced in his people will demonstrate not only to other people, but to the whole universe. And that's what God needs. Yeah. And, and the thing that we will Want. see, yes, yeah. So the things that we will see is that, um, that that's not the prop popular Protestant view at all, right? About righteousness by faith. The idea that you're going to have Christ's character perfectly reproduced in his people. And until that occurs, he's not going to come and claim them as his own. That that would be considered righteousness by works or some kind of fanaticism by other Christians, right? But but that is the message that Jones and Wagner taught, and so now the church takes that message of righteousness by faith, the third angel's message, and the three angels' messages, and they they call it you know last generation the theology and, and say it's some kind of fanatic fanatical view. So. Um, and, and, you know, and I heard that from Dave Bode when he was one of the guys who went to the Upper Room Bible Studies after he got baptized and, uh, in 86. Um, and, uh, you know, he, I was talking with him and he says, yeah, this, this last generation theology, this is the biggest danger to Adventism. So, um, you know, he was a person who was rather conservative in the past, but as a pastor, he's not. So anyway, we're going to read this uh, Froome's insistence, right, in this statement. So this is from Movement of Destiny. Uh, Men outside the Advent movement had the same general burden and emphasis and arising at about the same time. The impulse manifestly came from the same source and in timing, righteousness by faith centered in the year 1888. For example, the renowned Keswick Conferences of Britain were founded to promote practical holiness some 50 men could easily be listed in the closing decades of the 19th and the opening decades of the 20th centuries, all giving this general emphasis. So obviously, uh, Froome has no idea what righteousness by faith is or what the third angel's message, righteousness by faith in verity is, right? Okay, the conclusion is logical and inescapable. We should go to these sources to get the doctrine and to learn how to teach righteousness by faith and as we have done so for decades, in spite of the fact that the constant trend of this view of righteousness by faith is antinomian. That is, it's a rejection of the law of God, right? So 
This is the thing that I found when I was reading people like Andrew Murray. You know, it seems like a nice devotional book and, and tries to encourage, you know, trusting in God and so forth. But they really have no place for the law. That's, you know, so an antinomianism is, is the rejection of the Ten Commandments, rejection of God's moral law. And, and so what they, what they want is you just accept Christ's righteousness and you, you might have some improvement in, in your life to some degree, but, you know, you're, you're definitely not going to reflect Christ's character. Um, so anyway, um, the writer here goes on. We can believe that these evangelical leaders were good, sincere men living up to all the light they had. But did they proclaim the third angel's message in verity, as Ellen White described in the 1888 message? Our author concedes that while they did not understand our specific message, that is the Sabbath, the state of the dead, and other peculiar doctrines, nevertheless, they did proclaim the same righteousness by faith doctrine that the Lord gave us in 1888. Yet in contrast, Ellen White insists that the 1888 message contains a unique spiritual nutriment that leads to obedience to all the commandments of God, right? So that's why it's righteousness by faith in verity. Because if we think about the other aspects of righteousness by faith, now in justification, do we reflect Christ's character perfectly? When we first come to Christ and we confess our sins, and he forgives us and he he takes away our sins from us and puts covers us with his cloak of righteousness. Are we then manifesting Christ's character in no. our lives? No, right? Now, sanctification, the next step, you know, the second angel's message, um, it's just justification working out day by day, right? So we're going through an experience where God gives us more light. We see some sin that we didn't see before. And, and we go through trials and experiences and daily we receive justification. That's the work of sanctification, right? In just a general sense. It's a little bit simplified. But still then, are we manifesting Christ's character? Is Christ's character seen upon us under the second angel's message? Under sanctification. We'd have to say no. Now, the third angel's message, this is where we pass the Sabbath Sunday test, right? We stand on God's side. We give a message to the world. We, ex we are part of that loud cry. And then probation close and God declares us righteous. And then we have to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator through the time of the plagues. Is Christ's character seen upon his people under the third angel's message? Are we still sinning? No. No, right? Now, back in um, 2000, uh, the end of 2018, the beginning of 2019, well, through most of 2019, we had a message about a close of probation that was going to be November 9th, 2019. And, and the problem with that, because right away I recognized when we had this November 9th date, and I, I presented it at the at the camp meeting there in October of 2018, that this, this close of probation was not going to be, let him that is righteous be righteous still, let him that is filthy be filthy still. That is, we weren't going to magically all of a sudden not sin anymore. And there was many people in the movement teaching that when November 9th passes, that, that we won't be sinning anymore. And, and not just that, that we actually have to stop sinning before November 9th. It's like if you could just stop sinning, you know, like maybe a week or even a couple of days before November 9th, 2019, then you would be sealed and, and, and then you just wouldn't sin anymore, right? And I, and I ran into people there in 2018 who believed that, that they weren't sinning anymore, you know, because, you know, they understood Parminder's message of righteousness by faith and, and they, and they believed that they were righteous, right? Uh, quite disturbing when you think about it. But when, when it comes to God doesn't do something magical when he closes probation, when he declares the righteous is righteous, it's because they have experienced righteousness by faith in verity. That is, they have Christ's character, and it's then going to be demonstrated during the plagues that they have Christ's character. It's going to show that God can judge the heart, 
And that when God declares a man is righteous, he's righteous. And the wicked, when God declares them as wicked, they're not going to turn from their wickedness during the plagues. They're going to still be wicked. Right? They're not going to be righteous. Okay? So uh, this... I, 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 what's uh, that? The thing about, the thing about uh, the belief that you were just speaking about uh, mm -hmm. a certain day or whatever, yeah. and... and you might be sinning up to a few days before that day. Yeah, and then people were telling there's me. There's a couple, couple of, yeah, incredibly, they're missing missing some really important questions. How do you know you're not sinning? And also, the experience the experience of, of uh, the last people, the last generation at that time when there is no more mediator, they won't look at themselves as if they are perfect. They'll... Uh, They'll know that they have no conscious, unconfessed sins, but they'll be searching their hearts, wondering if they have, have sinned anywhere. They won't think that they're perfect. They'll, they'll know that they've been saved by the grace and mercy of God. This idea, wow, it's, it's just amazing. The, so they the amazing uh, yeah, and so they're going to experience righteousness by faith, not by sight. So, so let's go on here. So, um, this authoritative position logically supports our opponent's view that there is nothing special about the heart of the Seventh day Adventist message. It encourages their view that aside from what the valid gospel doctrine we may borrow from the evangelicals, the essence of Seventh day Adventism is legalism. Certainly, therefore, we have no mandate to call the Christian world to judgment and repentance. What is the true evaluation of the 1888 message? Was it the same doctrine that the Protestant reformers and 19th century evangelicals taught, as our authors insist, or was it a distinct, unique understanding of the everlasting gospel in relation to our special sanctuary message? Our official, officially endorsed authors all ignore any such special sanctuary relationship. This is, of course, in a really important point, right? Because it is the message of the sanctuary that illustrates the everlasting gospel, right? You know, the, the courtyard, you know, the, the, um, you know, the outer court, the inner court, the holy place, the most holy place. This is, this is an illustration of the gospel. And it's not something that's well understood. Um, definitely the sanctuary is not understood by, by Christians generally. I mean, they might not know anything about it, even, even many ministers. Um, they might know that the, the Jews sacrificed animals and that Christ was a sacrifice. Uh, but you know, what those offerings were and what they symbolized, there would be very little understanding of that. Now you might have Old Testament scholars, of course, are going to have a bit more understanding of the sanctuary. I know my, my grandfather, who was a United Church minister, in his library, he had a few different books on the sanctuary. Uh, they were, you know, still more detailed books about, you know, how the sanctuary worked and the different offerings and so forth. They weren't looking at Christ as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary or anything like that, um, which is definitely something that is foreign to Christians. So I remember when I first became an Adventist, I went to the Christian bookstore. I wanted to find a commentary on the book of Hebrews. And when I started looking through these commentaries, there would be it would be talking about Christ as our high priest in the verse. Um, but the commentator didn't seem to even notice that he didn't seem to even notice the sanctuary in the book of Hebrews. It was like very strange. Uh, even when the, the text is describing the sanctuary and the offerings, it's like the commentary didn't even notice that it was doing that. It was, it was very, very weird experience. So anyway, we know that this is about the sanctuary. Uh, the truth, the truth of this is crucial to understanding our identity as a people. If the message of 1888 was only the historic Protestant doctrine of justify, justification by faith, uh, we face some serious problems. Suppose we accept that Ellen White is correct in saying repeatedly, that the 1888 message was resisted and rejected. 
It must follow logically that Seventh-day Adventist Church leadership rejected the same doctrine that Luther and Wesley taught concerning righteous justification by faith. In other words, for us to say that the message of 1888 was the same doctrine that Luther Wesley had been teaching logically requires that our 1888 forefathers rejected the historic Protestant position. Such a rejection would be as disastrous as Rome's rejection of Luther or the Church of England's rejection of Wesley. This would be tantamount to a spiritual fall as bad as the fall of Babylon. But this cannot be, for it would destroy the foundations of the church. Thus, our authors are forced to assume that we accepted the message of 1888 and had a great revival. Again, if the view is true that the message of 1888 was the same doctrine of the reformers, it would require that Luther, Wesley, and many other servants of God from the 16th to the 19th centuries preached the third angel's message in verity. Thus, Seventh-day Adventists cannot logically see their identity in the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Some years ago, Louis R. Conradi, our leader in Europe, followed this official view idea to its logical end and maintain that Luther preached the third angel's message in the 16th century. Conradi in time left the church. He had also been an opposer of the message at the 1888 conference. And we are today losing ministers, members, and youth for the same basic reason. They see nothing unique and attractive in our gospel message. These officially endorsed views imply that there is nothing unique about it. Have our trusted historians unwittingly short-circuited the Seventh-day Adventist movement of destiny? If so, great damage has been done, for authoritatively published ideas have a great impact on the world church. Uh, the re-emphasis view of 1888. Another highly endorsed view of the 1888 message is that it was a mere re-emphasis of what the Adventist pioneers had believed from our very beginning, a recovery of a homiletical balance in doctrine and preaching temporarily lost between 1848, 44 and 1888. This view has come to be very widely believed. A few examples must suffice. Uh, so this is from Emmy Kern, Review and Herald, August 3rd, 1950. This conference, 1888, proved to be the beginning of a re-emphasis of this, this glorious truth which resulted in a spiritual awakening among our people. Um, and this is from uh, A.W. Spaulding, Arthur Spaulding, Captains of the Host, page 583. The greatest event of the 80s, referring to the 1880s, in the experience of the Seventh-day Adventists was the recovery or the restatement and new consciousness of their faith in the basic doctrine of Christianity. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. And then this is from uh, Pease, The Faith That Saves. There were those who accepted the 1888 emphasis on righteousness by faith. On the other extreme, there were those who thought this emphasis threatened the old landmarks. The reaction of the church during the 90s to the new emphasis on justification was mixed. So you, you can kind of see where this is going here. If this re-emphasis or emphasis view is correct, some further questions arise. How could conscientious leaders resist, spurn, or even neglect a re-emphasis of what they themselves had always believed and had preached some 20, 30, or 40 years before? Or if this session of 1888 included a new generation of Adventist preachers, how could they reject a glorious truth their immediate forebears had been preaching? So that's, that's a really good point. So when we think about it, you know, one of the things it would have to imply is that there was, as he's going to say in the next point, a moral fall within Adventism, that we had lost this truth, right? So he says, again, how could we defend ourselves against the charge that the Adventist church suffered a moral fall similar to that of Babylon if we accept the view that the 1888 brethren rejected a reemphasis of truth that they believed at the beginning of the Advent movement? When one is climbing upwards and suddenly goes backward, that is the fall. And we deplore offshoots and uncharitable critics unjustly saying that the church has fallen, as did Babylon. We don't believe it. But the official version of our 1888 history logically concedes this discouraging view. 
Many reasoning minds follow it to its ultimate conclusions, as did Conradi. The more we ferret out the truths of 1888, the more apparent it becomes that offshoots, fanaticism, apostasies, and lukewarm complacently proliferate because of our long-standing failure to recognize those realities. Now, just to kind of put this in a more recent context, so we can now see more clearly the fruits of this re-emphasis view. So what we have to believe is that really Adventism and its beginning didn't really understand righteousness by faith. That somehow we had Miller and it was all about prophecy. And then we had the disappointment in 1844. And then, um, you know, we, we built up this Adventist church. Um, but it was all just a bunch of legalists, right? People who were just into prophecy. They weren't really understanding salvation. And so finally, Jones and Wagner come along and now introduce to Adventism this lost doctrine. Either, either it's a doctrine that goes back to the Protestants, or maybe it's a doctrine that, you know, Miller taught, or maybe the early Adventist experienced, but had been gone from, from the movement. So we can see why there isn't an interest in understanding our history. Because, well, until we get to 1888, we're not even teaching the gospel. Right? So this is part of the problems. Now, if we look at the fruit of this, if we want to, you know, try to bring this presently, we now have a counterfeit movement to ours. So we have all kinds of Adventists who, in rejecting this view of 1888, have gone back to Millerite history. And we see uh, rejection of the three persons of the Godhead, right? We see that happening within Adventism. Other types of things like, you know, accepting fees. An amazing, uh, uh, an amazing thing to see, really. Uh, no matter what the evidence is presented, they will not be convinced otherwise. It, once they believe it, it's, I've, I've not seen the person come back from that. You know, it's very difficult. Now, but you can see it's it, it's it's undermined the church. The church has undermined itself as as being relevant because it's so obvious that the church has rejected light, and so people have to they're they're trying to go back and discover this light, right? In in various different ways, um, and you know, there's all kinds of you know people you know talking about the charts and talking about the first, second, and third angel's messages now, but they don't have the understanding that we do, right? That is, and I've talked with lots of these people, and they, they just see, they what they're really going back to is is what the church says that the church was. So they're going back to a type of legalism, uh, rejecting all kinds of uh, truths that are plainly taught in the spirit of prophecy. They think somehow that that's how we're going to revive uh, Adventism is just basically becoming Millerites. And of course, that's regressive. Like we understand in going back and looking at the past, what are we doing? Why, why are we looking at Millerite history? What does Millerite history do for this movement? Shows us a pattern. Okay. So we look back on the past because as we're passing over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, it reflects back on the past events, and those past events then shine a light forward on our path, right? That's what we understand, Ellen White says. So, so one is we have to experience something now that's parallel to Millerite history in order to understand Millerite history. So we experienced Millerite history in this movement, and that was the unsealing of uh the, the the seven thunders right so now we understand millerite history and um now as we continue to look at millerite history we can then understand 1888 because we can understand why the message is rejected in the first place okay <clears throat> so um 
This chapter will present evidence that the message of 1888 was not a mere re-emphasis of the doctrines of Luther and Wesley, nor even of the Adventist pioneers. Neither was it a replay of what the Keswick speakers and popular Protestant leaders of the day taught as the doctrine of righteousness by faith. It was greater than these. It was the beginning of a more mature concept of the everlasting gospel. Now, we understand the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers, which Wheelan and Short don't understand, of course, because this book's written in 1987. And uh, we have to still we have to still go through it events to understand that anyway. So more mature concept of the everlasting gospel it is the beginning of a more mature concept of the everlasting gospel then had been clearly uh, perceived by any previous generation. It was the beginning of the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit as the latter reign. It was the initial announcement, the message of the fourth angel of Revelation 18. So we saw that. In A.T. Jones' 1893 General Conference Bulletin, he believed that the angel of Revelation 18 had come down um, in that history from 1888 to 1892. Now, of course, because the message was rejected, that that angel, the second angel, was rejected. And, and the reason the second angel was rejected is the first angel had been rejected. So... In that history, there is no way that this message could have been accepted unless they had accepted the first and second angels' messages. And they would have to be repeated and do their work in order for the third angel to be empowered. Right? So that's what we understand about this message, is that it, it, it understands the first and second angels' message. Uh, this is not to say that the messengers of 1888 were greater than Paul, Luther, Wesley, or anyone else, nor that they were keener, brighter students. The message they brought was simply the third angel's message in verity, an understanding of righteousness by faith, parallel to and consistent with the time of the end doctrine of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, where the high priest ministers in the anti-typical day of atonement in the most holy place. He entered upon that last phase of his work in 1844. From there, he ministers true justification by faith to those who follow him by faith. Hence, there is something unique about justification by faith in the light of the Day of Atonement, and the 1888 message recognizes this, or recognizes it. So this is, to me, the most troubling thing about this re-emphasis view is, one is, it's really, there isn't much belief in Adventism about the value of the sanctuary message. Um, you know, one pastor, and one writer, um, you know, he just said, basically, we have brought two doctrines to Adventism. This is what, or to, to Christianity that Adventism has brought. One is that we need to have one day of rest a week and that Christ is being judged. That's his, that's the Sabbath and, and the sanctuary. I, I was on mute, but I did chuckle a little bit at that. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, but but that's it. This idea that Christ is being judged. You know, they don't want us to be judged. You know, Christ is the one being judged in the Day of Atonement, which, of course, makes no sense. It's not what the sanctuary would teach. Um, and, and so, so this idea that, that we have this watered down sort of, well, I mean, it's, it's not even watered down. It's, it's just complete error. It's contradictory to, to the message. But this is a result of, of accepting the view of justification by faith that doesn't need the sanctuary in heaven and that doesn't need the law, right? So if you have a view of justification by faith that just does away with the law, that it's nailed to the cross and has no understanding of Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary of, of the Day of Atonement, then obviously you're going to reject the Sabbath and the Day of Atonement. If allowed free course for heart acceptance and theological development, the message would have prepared a people to meet the Lord, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing 
without fault before the throne of God. Um, at Ephesians 5.25, Revelation 14, verse 5. It was intended by its divine author to ripen the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. If this is not true, Ellen White's lifetime credibility must suffer, as well as our denominational self-respect. Further, the obvious undeniable rejection of that message did not constitute a moral or a spiritual fall of the remnant church involving a repudiation of Protestant theology. It was rather an arresting of her ordained spiritual development, a pitiful blindness, an inability to recognize the eschatological consummation of the love and call of the Lord. So, um, so obviously if we don't see these things in the context of end time events, like last generation theology, if we reject last generation theology, we're really rejecting Adventism. We're rejecting the third angel's message. The rejection of that message virtually eclipsed an ethical and practical understanding of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. It left only the outward shell of doctrinal structure, such as the chronological proofs of the 2300 years and the mechanical concept of the investigative judgment as preached by us before 1888. <coughs> Our own retarded growth in understanding has invited the scorn of evangelical opponents who derive this unique Adventist truth as flat, stale, and profitless. This is why many of our own people, especially our youth, see the sanctuary doctrine as boring and irrelevant. irrelevant. Now, we have made applications here to what happened in 1888, to what's happening in the movement presently. And have we heard from people in the movement that the studying that we're doing on chronology is flat, stale, and profitless, and that it's boring and irrelevant. Have we heard that from people in the movement? Yes. Yes. What you know? Yes, you know, yes. and, and so we know that, you know, one of the things that's always amazed me, and, and I don't say this in sort of some kind of judgment of others, you know, it's, you know, it's not funny or anything. But there are Adventists who believe that um, most of the Bible shouldn't be studied because it's not relevant, that prophecy is unimportant, that the, that the stories in the Bible, they might have some like devotional things that we could apply, you know, like the book of Judges, we could maybe get some nice little um, you know, children's stories out of those. It's such a devaluation of, of the significance of God's word as living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So all of scripture is given for doctrine, reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be, uh, you know, for, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, right? I know I didn't quote it exactly correct, but we can't we can't just dismiss, you know, we, we don't have an understanding of the 2300 days, for instance, in Adventism. Um, you know, most Adventists probably, you know, I would say probably less than 1% could give a really good study on the 2300 days in really? its connection with 70 weeks. What's that? I was just say uh, a lot of Adventists can't nail down the starting point, you know. Yeah. Of it. Yeah, and well, you know, and definitely, you know, they they might say, you know, if they know anything about it and they've done studies on it, they might say, you know, it's going to the the going forth of the commandment is going to be in the seventh year of Artaxerxes in the fall of 457, but actually, it's not going to be in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. It's going to be in the eighth year of Artaxerxes. Because the, the, the seventh year of Artaxerxes started in the fall of 458. And, and so, you know, I remember when I first tried to like prove 457, I, I couldn't do it. You know, I mean, I, I didn't understand what happened. Not until we got the Ezra 7 9 
And, you know, the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month. And, and then from that, we can figure out the 10th day of the seventh month. And that's going to be in the eighth year of Artaxerxes. It's just the going forth of the commandment is in the seventh year, right? When it, that's what, that's what nailed it for me. That's what nailed yeah. it for me. This is, this yeah. is when you first started, uh, a few years ago when you first started teaching it. Yeah. And that, then, that's I, then, I, then I understood, yeah. understood it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the thing that for me is, you know, I've been an Adventist a long time now, so it'd be 40, 41 years uh, at Christmas. And, I mean, it wasn't until I understood the book of Ezra that I actually now knew that I could support the 2,300 years, the 2,300 days, and and also the 70 weeks, um, you know, because I – you have to be able to support 457. And I didn't know how to do it before. So this message made me an Adventist for the first time, an Adventist who could confidently say, I understand this doctrine that I've been trying to understand for, you know, that time about 35 years or so, you know, um, cause that was the one thing that always evaded me and that I would talk to all kinds of people about pastors and I would try to, to figure out, like, how do we get, you know, October 22nd, 1844? You know, it just, I never knew until I was in this movement. So, um, so obviously it's not something that's flat, stale, and profitless, uh, these, these understanding the sanctuary. And especially when we put it in the context of, you know, the 2300 days, the 2520, all of these other prophetic lines, and we see it in Millerite history, it all just comes alive to us, right? It all becomes meaningful. But without that, it, it, it is flat, stale, and profitless as it's being taught by uh, Seventh-day Adventists. It's not even really a convincing thing anymore when it comes to evangelistic series. I mean, they hardly teach any prophet, prophecy when it comes to evangelistic series. It's It's pretty much, you know, sort of popular Christianity and sensationalism and stuff. So <clears throat> anyway, we're going to move on to this next section. Uh, what Ellen White saw in the message of 1888. As soon as she had heard a little of Dr. Wagner's message at Minneapolis for the first time, incidentally, she recognized it to be precious light in harmony with what she had been trying to present during the previous 45 years. She knew no jealousy, but welcomed the messengers and their message. It was a further development in full harmony with past light, but never clearly preached before. I see the beauty of truth in the presentation of the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law, as the doctor has placed it before us. You say, many of you, that it is light and truth, yet you have not presented it in its light heretofore, that which has been presented harmonizes perfectly with the light which God has been pleased to give me during all the years of my experience. If our ministering brethren would accept the doctrine which has been presented so clearly, the people would be fed with their portion of meat in due season. Uh, the brethren at Minneapolis themselves understood the message to be a revelation of new light rather than a re-emphasis of what they had formerly preached. This is implied as follows. One brother asked me if I thought there was any new light that we should have or any new truths. Well, shall we stop searching the scriptures because we have light on the law of God and the testimony of his spirit? No, brethren. So, um, <clears throat> thus, the message of 1888 was something which the brethren had not previously comprehended. It was a failure to appreciate the heart and verity of the third angel's message, the outward forms of which alone they understood. There are but few, even of those who claim to believe it, that comprehend the third angel's message, and yet this is the message for this time. It is present truth. But how few take up this message in its true bearing, and presented to the people in its power. With many, it has but little force. Said my guide, there is much light yet to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. This message understood in its true character and proclaimed in the spirit will lighten the earth with its glory. Uh, so this is Olson again. Um, 
Uh, <clears throat> um, and then from testimonies, five testimonies, 714, 715. The peculiar work of the third angel has not been in its importance, not been seen in its, its importance. God meant that his people should be far in advance of the position which they occupy today. It is not in the order of God that light has been kept from our people, the very present truth which they needed for this time. Nor, not all our ministers are giving the third angel's message, who are giving the third angel's message, really understand what constitutes that message. Ellen White never at any time used the word re-emphasis or even emphasis in respect of the 1888 message. Clearly it appeared to be new light, which contradicted ideas held by the brethren, just as the Jews thought that Christ contradicted Moses, when in fact his message fulfilled Moses. Her context is the message and its reception. We see that God, we see the God of that the God of heaven sometimes commissions men to teach that which is regarded as contrary to the established doctrines because those who were once the depositaries of truth became unfaithful to their sacred trust. The Lord chooses others who would receive the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness and would advocate truths that were not in accordance with the ideas of the religious leaders. Even Seventh-day Adventists are in danger of closing their eyes to truth as it is in Jesus, because it contradicts something which they have taken for granted as truth, but which the Holy Spirit teaches is not truth. Now, of course, this has been not just in the area of righteousness by faith, but, you know, understanding all of this message, people see it as contrary to the established doctrines, and yet it's light that comes from God. There was a principle which made an advanced revelation of new light necessary in 1888. This is stated in one of Ellen White's sermons at Minneapolis. The Lord has need of men who are worked by the Holy Spirit, who are certainly receiving manna fresh from heaven. Upon the minds of such, God, God's word flashes light. Um, that which God gives his servants to speak today would not perhaps have been present truth 20 years ago, but it is God's message for this time. There was a distinct difference in her mind between the message of righteousness by faith and I think by this reference to Olson here, this is actually that, um, I'm not sure, like this is maybe that compilation made by Olson, I think is what it is. Anyway, there's a distinct difference in her mind between the message of righteousness by faith as presented in 1888 and the past message the Lord sent prior to 1888. Well, there was to be no contradiction. There must be further development. We want the past message and the fresh, mes fresh message, but her appeals are not a license to fanaticism or novel ideas irresponsibly proclaimed. Now, just to comment on this, so I don't like the word development, even though, you know, it, it is an okay word, because, you know, that development can just be evolution, right? Um, but I, I like the word actually unfolding. Uh, and if I would use the word development, I would think of it more like... Uh, a Beethoven uh, um, uh, sonata or something like that, where you have, you know, musical development, you have a theme and an idea, and it, it develops, right? It becomes more more complex, more developed, or like a flower that is, you know, goes into bloom and then has seeds and all that. Because, you know, the one thing we want to avoid is the idea that, because when we talk about truth being progressive, it's not the type of progression that we would get from uh, uh, evolution by that. So that is, the, in evolution, you're going from, and evolution doesn't really happen, but in the idea of revolu evolution, you go from this less developed creature to these more complex creatures, right? You know, so man evolves, he becomes smarter and better and all these kinds of things. Um, and, and that always sometimes implies that there was something faulty with the message at the beginning. But just like a flower, in a flower in its different stages of development, is it somehow less perfect, you know, when it first starts to, as a seed and it grows into a plant and then it has flowers and then 
that you know produces seed. In every stage it, it, of its development, it is perfect, right? If it's a perfect plant, right? Yes. It's, yeah, it's not that it's it's going from some lesser thing to some greater thing. And and, and I bring that up just because um, the one thing that I see about this message is that it has been a unfolding of truth that has come to this movement. That is, new light is an unfolding of past light. It's seen in a new setting, but it is still emphasizes it. It supports the old truths. And that's the reason I accepted this message, just like as Jeff was talking about. We understand the old truths better because of what God, the light that God has given us. We're not, we're not getting some, well, you know, what they thought, you know, that was an inferior understanding. We have a better understanding, you know, like in that sort of way. What they had was perfect. When we read Miller, uh, obviously there's things that he didn't understand, but there is stuff in Miller that we, we need to understand. And those things become even clearer as we, we see the message unfolding. So, so I think that's a really important thing about new light is it's, it's an unfolding of old light. It's, it is not, and, and the old truths are seen more clearly. And that's what happens with Jones and Wagner's message. Also what happens with this movement. So fanatical or novel ideas irresponsibly proclaimed as he puts in those brackets there at the end of that paragraph. That's what I, we see happening with um, so many of the doctrines such as lunar Sabbaths or feast keeping or, you know, Wednesday crucifixion theories and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? All of these, all of this new light has to reject old established truths, right? Yeah. Seems, seems to be that way. Agree. New light. New Light must, does not do that. In a series of review articles in early 1890, Ellen White discussed the cleansing of the sanctuary truth in connection with the controverted 1888 message of righteousness by faith. Each truth um, com complemented the other. There was a desperate need for a more profound understanding of the everlasting gospel in relation to the Day of Atonement. And we can see that that was something that was lacking, right? We have this doctrine of the Day of Atonement, but the 1888 message started to bring that into focus. So anyway, Ellen White says, we are in the Day of Atonement, and we are to work in harmony with Christ's work of cleansing the sanctuary. We must now set before the people the work which, by faith, we see our great high priest accomplishing in the heavenly sanctuary. The mediatorial work of Christ, the grand and holy mysteries of redemption, are not studied or comprehended by the people who claim to have light in advance of every other people on the face of the earth. Were Jesus personally upon earth, he would address a large number who claim to believe present truth with the words he addressed to the Pharisees. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. There are old yet new truths still to be added to the treasures of our knowledge. We do not understand or exercise faith as we should. We're not called to worship and serve God by the use of the means employed in former years. God requires higher service now than ever before. He requires the improvement of the heavenly gifts. He has brought us into a position where we need higher and better things than have ever been needed before. That was uh, Review and Herald, um, February 25th, 1890. We have been hearing his voice more distinctly in the message that has been going for the last two years. We have only just begun to get a little glimmering of what faith is. So that's Review and Herald, March 11th, 1890. <clears throat> so we and short go on. This is evident. The message of 1888 was light, which the brethren had not seen or presented heretofore. It was our meat in due season, food for today, 
not manna restored from yesterday. Ellen White heard at Minneapolis for the first time a doctrinal unfolding of what she had been trying to present all along, the matchless charms of Christ in the light of the Day of Atonement ministry. No other human lips had preached it. And so, I like that word unfolding there. Um, she recognized in E.J. Wagner, an agent used by the Lord for an advanced revelation of truth to his people and to the world. The verity of the third angel's message had not been comprehended by our, our ministers because they had not advanced in understanding as they should have 44 years after the beginning of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Instead, advanced light had been kept from the people. So the brethren at the time understood her support of Wagner and Jones as a recommendation of the new light which they brought. It was not a call to their original understanding of the established doctrines. It opposed a mere re-emphasis of the old understandings. Had brethren Butler, Smith, and others so understood it, would they not have been strong to champion it instead of opposing it as they did? Therefore, what the brethren rejected was the call for the most decided changes. They did not refuse to go back. They refused to go forward. Thus, they tried to stand still. A difficult thing for any army on the march. Okay, so. Okay, I'm going to stop there, mostly because I'm tired. And any final comments on this section of what we've studied here today? I have one. Uh, I've, I think I've said it before um, regarding speaking to the, the experience of the, the last generation, God's people, the remnant. Uh, yeah. It's, 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 just let me gather my thought for a second here. I'm tired too. Uh, this is speaking, to, speaking to the idea that, that God's character, oh, excuse me. God's character will be perfectly reproduced and, and that it must be for him to return. Um, he's waiting for that so that we can be his witnesses to the whole universe. But, uh, I know, I know that intellectually and by faith, I know that it, it can happen. And when I, when I survey the landscape of my life, if it were not for faith and hope, uh, I would despair, or sink down in the sand quickly. Uh, but because I fail repeatedly over some of the same things over and over and over, eventually we get it, but or I get it. But you know, the thing is, I that's I guess that's where the the faith righteousness by faith because I don't see myself. Uh, ever being able to perfectly re reproduce the character of God in, in my in a practical way in my life, I see <laughs> rays of light here and there. But by faith, I know I don't give up that it can happen. Uh, I yeah. guess that's what people why they reject it or you know push back against it because they look at their life and they go impossible. I'll never be saved. That that just can't be true. Well, I, but I also think that people don't even really see themselves as sinners. So you have the other example of people who um, they think they're all okay, right? You know, they they sort of have it made. Reminds me of that book, uh, uh, Transactional Analysis, uh, that, that your father in the 70s and all of us in high school yeah. were looking at, I'm okay, you're okay. Remember that one? Yeah, young yeah, parents and child, that kind of stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know. And, and uh, yeah. bringing up your parents, I want—I do want to say that you had also spoken about love and and how we can understand it intellectually and it is a doctrine and so on. But to demonstrate it until we can see it demonstrated, we don't really even begin to understand it. And then when we we give it, when we're able to receive it, and then in turn share it in our life with others that mm -hmm. we truly experience love. Now, your home, when your parents brought me in to your home as a mm -hmm. really mixed up teenager, <laughs> um, that was where I experienced such pe a peaceful home. You know, I grew up in a crazy home. You know much about it. But, yeah. Uh, 
you know, a peaceful home and, and love and graciousness. I learned what that word meant by graciousness. Now, of course, your dad was could be quite exasperating at times, but he was such a kind man. Yeah, well, he had asked your mom. So, you know, you can kind of excuse it a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, you know, right, right. he, he was social. Yeah, but but yeah, he was a kind man. You know, not not so kind to me as a kid. You know, because he he was sarcastic and and a little bit critical. But he didn't really understand kids. I, I don't well, think he. Ever, I don't think he ever was a kid. Um, you know, right. <laughs> he he had to work at a pretty young age, and. Uh, mm-hmm. His dad died. And work he did. He worked hard. He was one of the hardest pe- working people I ever knew. Yeah. Stop, but anyway, stopping to eat a meal was an inconvenience to him. Yeah, I know. And uh, yeah, I definitely miss him and my mom, of course. Yeah. So anyway, it there is, um, you know, there is to understand Christ's character, you know, because we're not God. Right. And um, and we're, we're so far from God. And yet we can try to fool ourselves that we're so much better than we really are. I mean, to me, that's the whole point of the gospel is to see how far from God we are. And yet God in that, in that very recognition that we have where we can confess our sins and forsake them, God can transform us. But we never recognize it as us. <laughs> Right. We recognize it as Christ's righteousness. It's his goodness, his righteousness. But God puts that righteousness in us and it's going to be revealed to the world in spite of what we think about ourselves. So to me, that's that's the the whole power of the gospel to transform the sinner into into Christ. And and that's so mocked within Adventism where you're going to have a bunch of little Christ's walking around. One pastor said to me. You know, that's what you think is going to happen. There's going to be a bunch of little Christs. But Christ's character has to be perfectly reproduced in his people. It's Christ's character, not mine. And and yet it will be seen as mine. So that's that's the gift. That's the exchange. Well, thanks, everyone, uh, for the study. So uh, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful. Uh, for what you do in our lives. We're thankful for the love that we've been able to understand. I know Heidi is still struggling with understanding God's love and accepting the love that um, she gave a testimony a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we pray for her that she can continue uh, to understand your love for her. And we are are thankful, Lord, uh, for the people around us that we do love and the people that have loved us in spite of the fact that we are unlovely. Um, and we are thankful, Lord, of course, for what Christ has done for us and um, his acceptance of us and his patience and his kindness. We just ask, Lord, that we can experience that and that we can show that kind of love to others. Forgive us for our sins. Give for our sins your righteousness. Be with us throughout this Sabbath. We pray for the meetings tomorrow morning, and we pray for those who are seeking your face. Please be with them. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray and ask in faith. Amen.